Hello friends, and welcome back to the Juice for CMake Developers video series. My name is Ben Vining, and I am a self-taught C++ developer with a great interest in CMake, which is why I am making this video series. In the last video, I discussed some of the pros and cons of CMake, and I compared and contrasted it with the producer. Um, the goal of this video series is to get to building a Juice project as quickly as possible, but I really wanted to make sure to lay the groundwork of some of the basics of CMake so that we really understand fundamentally what we're doing and how it works. So in this video, I'm going to go over some of the basics of the CMake scripting language, and in the next video, I'm going to cover the types of targets in CMake, and we're going to start with actually building something, just some basic C++ code in CMake, and then in video four, we'll actually build a Juice project, since those are a little bit more advanced. Um, I thought it would be good to have kind of like a fundamental understanding of the basics of CMake first. So first of all, sort of the how and why of the CMake language. Um, what the CMake executable actually is, fundamentally, is a scripting language interpreter. So when you're generating a project build system, what it does is it evaluates all your script files as an interpreter. Um, and in those scripting files, you describe your build, you set up all your different targets, but you can also execute other commands. You can interact with the file system of the computer you're on. You can do pretty much anything that you could do in another scripting language like Python or something like that. Um, and then at the end of processing all of those scripting commands, then it actually outputs the build files based on the build tree that you've created. But you actually can just run a CMake script on its own without generating a build system, um, which is a common use case for if you're creating a custom target that just needs to do some work but not actually build anything. It's very common to have that target actually execute a CMake script because you already know that CMake is on the computer that you're running on. And so that's something that I'll discuss um, in more detail in a later video. But I wanted to discuss why CMake is a scripting language, because in the last video, I mentioned that I'm sort of coming at this from the standpoint of somebody who maybe already has their build system set up and is not interested in or doesn't have time to learn a new scripting language. And the... The reason why CMake is a scripting language is because it allows you to do some fairly high-level things um, that manipulate your build graph from a very sort of high-level descriptive uh, manner, and CMake then takes all that information and translates it into lower-level details, such as flags that may be specific to the compiler or linker that you're using. And as I mentioned in the last video, I believe that it is a positive of CMake, that it is a scripting language, because it allows you to do more uh, sophisticated responses to your build environment. Like you can have if, else blocks, you can have for loops, um, you can have conditional options that the user can configure from outside the project that will affect how it um, sets up the build. And so all of these things are reasons why I believe it's actually a positive that CMake is a scripting language. And it's not a very complex language. To start here, I just want to show you, this is an actual CMakeLists.txt file for one of my own projects. Um, this is what it looks like. This is this file right here in the top level directory of this project. So when you run CMake in a directory, it automatically looks for this file, spelled exactly like this, cmakelists.txt. Um, any project or any directory that you're adding to CMake, it automatically looks for this file and treats it as, excuse me, treats it as the entry point for that directory. And so at the top level here, right away I have this command called project, which basically just states the name, version, any languages it's using, a short description, and then a URL where you can get more information about it. And I really like the fact that this command is pretty much like it does some setup work for you. For example, saying language is CXX here, what that does is that CMake is going to enable the C++ compiler. But this also serves as sort of inline documentation because right away you can just at a glance at the very top here you can see languages 
description and homepage URL. So as well as performing work, this command is also inline documentation. And I think that's a great strength of CMake. A lot of their commands are somewhat like that. And the reason that is, is because the language is very declarative. So as we're just looking through this file here, that should be an immediate takeaway, is that everything is very declarative. And another immediate takeaway here is that everything is a command. So here, what I'm doing is I'm setting some variables. So in other scripting languages, like for example, Python, you might expect to see something like this. Um, where the variable name is actually sort of like an entity and then you can assign something to it. Um, but in CMake, that's not the case. Every single thing is a command. So setting a variable, you use the set command. And the first argument here is the name of the variable and then um, the value. And to get the value of a variable that has been set is you use this syntax here, dollar curly brace and then you put the name of the variable in between the curly braces here. And the way this works is this is actually text replacement. So this command here, before this command ever gets actually executed, what the interpreter will do is it will replace this whole segment of text with the value of this variable. So the list append command does not actually know anything about CMake current list or variable, it just receives the value of this as a string. Um, there are no types in CMake. Everything is a string. So when you're seeing things like this, set, 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 basically the state of the CMake scripting interpreter is essentially a large table of key value pairs with the key and value both being strings. So if I were to do this, if I were to come down in here and set this to something else, it just simply overwrites this value, pretty much as expected. Um, another cool thing about variable expansion like this is that it can actually be recursive. So if I'm going to go into a blank CMake file here, and then I can just set maybe the variable apple to the string foo. And then I can set orange to the string apple. And then I'm going to print out a message. Um, the keyword status here just means that it's going to be a regular message printed. You can also say warning or error or stuff like that. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to print this. What do you think this will print? Sorry, let me get back to where this file is. So that's this file right here. And then if you execute from the command line cmake-p, what this does is it executes a cmake script um, simply as a script without generating a build system. And so this has printed foo. So what happened here is that first it started at the innermost piece of um, uh, variable expansion. And so first it found the value of orange to be apple, and it replaced that, and then what you had was this, and then it found the value of apple to be foo. So what the message command actually saw was this, even though in our script we had this. And so that, I think, is something that's pretty nifty about CMake, is that um, you can have dynamic variable names referenced like this. However, um, if you try to expand something that has not been set, then it simply prints an empty string. So here, blarg has not been set. This variable doesn't exist. And when this is expanded, it's simply an empty string like this. And uh, it's not an error or a warning. It just simply expands to an empty string. And so that is something that can cause some headaches in CMake because if you make a typo, then you can have that just sort of silently fail and it will not warn you about that. Variables in CMake are scoped. So if you define some sort of function here, 
Um, and as I said, everything in CMake is a command. So even function, defining a function, there's actually a command called function and a command called end function. So even this is a command. And the first argument here is the name of the function that you're defining. Um, so if you have some sort of function, you can set whatever variables you want uh, in here. And then outside of the function, you will see that this is not actually defined. So I'm defining a function, I'm calling that function, and then I'm going to print the value of the variable apple, which was set inside this function. And as you can see, again, it has printed an empty string. And the reason for that is because inside this function, we set apple, but that does not affect the values of variables outside this function. However, so the set command has this special keyword parent scope. And now if I execute this, now we can see it has printed the string pi. And now the reason why is because when we call this function, it sets the variable apple in the scope of the caller. So now this value is visible outside this function. The reason why this is useful is because functions in CMake are not expressions. There are no return values. So for example, you cannot do something like this. And as you can see, my, high, my syntax highlighter here is sort of telling you you can't really do this. Um, this doesn't work. So there's no way to actually like return a value. There is a return command, but it takes no arguments. Um, return just simply exits out of the function. You can't actually return a value. So the only way to have some data from a function visible to outside the function is to use this set command with the parent scope keyword. So if you're ever looking through CMake files and you see them doing something like this, where they're setting something with this parent scope keyword here, that's pretty much analogous to a return value um, because functions in CMake are not expressions. One thing that is um, made somewhat easier by this fact is that you can return multiple things. You can, you know, quote unquote, return multiple things from a function. So you can have this, um, you know, just like this, and then both apple and orange will be visible from outside this function. And you can also continue to do more work inside your function after setting something to the parent scope. This does not actually return from the function, even though this will be visible from outside. Um, the last thing I wanna cover for this video is the concept of the variable cache. So you'll notice here, I'm saying set, and then after I have the variable name and the value, then I have this cache keyword. So this here, this limes install dest variable is something that I want to have be configurable from outside the project. You know, somebody who's building this or if a, another super project is including this, then maybe they want to override this from outside. And so that is why the CMake variable cache exists. Cache variables are very special because when the interpreter encounters this command, what it will do is it will look up limes install dest in the variable cache, and if an entry, lines install dest, already exists in the variable cache, then this command does nothing. But if this entry is not already in the cache, then it is initialized to this value. And as I mentioned, variable scoping, the cache is a global scope. So the entire CMIC project, any directory, any function, the cache is basically a global scope that anybody can see what's in the cache. And it is also persistent. So between runs of CMake, um, it actually generates a text file that holds all these values in the build directory. And so if you configure CMake um, and set some cache variables 
um, then the next time you run CMake, you won't have to set all of them again. It will sort of remember your preferences. And that's a good way to think of cache variables is basically like user preferences that are configurable. And I showed you the CMake GUI last time. And all of these variables in here, these are all cache variables. So just having a normal thing, a normal set command like this, this just sets a variable that's internal to the interpreter and will not appear in the GUI. But this will appear in the GUI. And so the assumption here is that cache variables are basically exposed to the user and able to be overridden from the command line or from the GUI. And once you set this either from the command line or in the GUI, then you can rerun CMake and it will remember what you chose. And if you're setting something in the cache, this, is, this variable right after cache is a type. So it can be bool or as you saw string or file path or path, which is a path to a directory. Um, and in the GUI, when it's actually displaying these, it uh, displays ways of setting them that are appropriate to what the, the type is. So for a Boolean, you get a little checkbox on or off here. This one is a file path, and you get a file browser here. And then for just regular strings, then you can have just sort of this default text entry tool. And the last argument to this is a documentation string which the CMake GUI also displays for you. So if you hover, then it, that is the documentation string that was set by the CMake script. So as you can already see, CMake is a fairly powerful tool because at the same time as you're configuring your build, you're basically also configuring this whole nice GUI application for somebody building your project that can be quite user-friendly with various types and documentation strings, um, which is right in line with all of your actual project configuration here. Um, so I think that's a, a strength of CMake. So um, that's the majority of what I wanted to cover for this video. I hope that this wasn't an overload of information. I don't want to get too deep into CMake as a language because there are um, more things you can do. You can get fairly complex with it, but for building a basic project, that's really all you need to know is that everything is a command, it's very declarative, and then how to set and retrieve variables and a basic understanding of the concept of the cache which will continue to expand upon as we go through this video series. So hopefully this is a pretty good primer on the language. And next time we will actually build a, um, a basic target and, and discuss different types of targets in CMake. But again, hopefully the takeaways from this video should be that the CMake language is fairly simple. It's very declarative. Everything is a command. There are no types. Everything is a string. Everything is a command, including setting variables, even returning from a function or file is a command, and even declaring a function is used uh, the function command. And one last note that I wanted to make is that the less CMake code, the better. Um, some people go fairly crazy with doing as much as they possibly can in their CMake. And as much as I love CMake, I actually think that the language is designed to discourage you from doing that. Um, the fact that there are no data structures, everything's a string, um, makes it really difficult to do any sort of super high level processing. and. That is a limitation, but I also think that it's a good guideline because if you're doing super complex scripting just to set up your build, then I think that that's an indication that you need to rethink your strategy. And so I actually really appreciate that about CMake because if something is difficult to implement in CMake, 
then it makes me rethink why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, yeah, so again, the less CMake code, the better. And next time we will discuss different types of targets in CMake and we will do sort of like the hello world of just building a target in CMake. So thank you for watching and I will see you next time.